Have you heard Jesus overpowers legion? In this lesson, we will learn that God has power over everything and everyone. Happy Sunday. Happy Women's Month. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be part of our Sunday school? Then subscribe, like, comment, and ring the bell to be notified every time I post a new video on our Sunday school. I am still doing this, this small giveaway for the month of March. The rules are simple. Answer the questions and the questions are inside of the lesson. So you have to watch the lesson and when it gets to the part about the questions, just answer the questions in the comments below. Hi, I'm Regina Reed and I teach Sunday school at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maven, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. Jesus Overpowers Legion. Devotional reading is 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Background scripture is Mark, the 5th chapter, verses 1 through 20. And Luke, the 8th chapter, 26 to 39th verse. And our key verse is Mark, the 5th chapter, and the 20th verse. Today's date is March 26, 2023. Our lesson aims. List some key elements in Jesus' encounter with the demonic. Explain the Masonic secret and how this story breaks with the theme of in Mark's gospel. Share testimony about Jesus' intervention in your life. Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, may we remember your son's mighty power and be quick to ask for deliverance. May we as your servants show our gratitude by proclaiming to others the good things you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Introduction. Some years ago, the author took up historical fencing or swordsmanship as a hobby for fun and to stay in better shape. He took to it quickly and his natural agility quickly elevated him to become one of the better fencers in their club. In a one-on-one -on -one match, he usually defeated his opponent. One day, the club decided to play a game and he found himself fencing two people at once. He had beaten both of them individually, but it was a great challenge to fight too. Despite his aptitude and skill, he could not defend himself for long against two and went down in defeat. Their game was an unfair fight in which he was outnumbered and lost. Today's passage tells us of a similar scenario with a very different outcome, less in context. Mark's gospel was likely written between AD 60 and 62, certainly before Matthew, Luke, or John. With Matthew and Luke, the book of Mark rounds out the synoptic gospels, so-called because of their similar records of Jesus' earthly ministry. Today's text from Mark 5 is one example of the book's shared material with parallels in Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 28 through 34, and Luke, the 8th chapter, verses 26 through 39. The difference between the accounts say less about the historical accuracy of the event than about the faith perspectives the writers brought to the details. A somewhat perplexing characteristic of the Gospel of Mark is also on display in the account. Jesus' tendency throughout the first half of the book to tell people whom Jesus had healed to keep quiet about the matter. This is found in Mark, the first chapter, verses 44, 7th chapter, verse 36, and the 8th chapter, verses 30. This has been called the Masonic secret. Many theories have been proposed for the, this counterintuitive command to silence. And one such is that Jesus did not want the people to become invested in wrong ideas about what it meant for him to be the Messiah. While the people were looking for a political Messiah to deliver them from Roman imperialism, Jesus used the time of secrecy to teach about the larger role of the Messiah beyond Israel and its politics. Jesus also wanted his ministry to be defined as a preaching and teaching ministry more than a healing and miracles ministry. This is found in Mark, the first chapter, verse 35 to 39. The constant need of people around him and of crushing crowds looking for healing could have taken all his time if Jesus had not guarded it carefully. His preaching ministry was supported by the miracles, not the other way around. This suggests an element of crowd control. 
The account of the Gardarene demonic occurs during Jesus' preaching ministry in Galilee. This story is in a section of Mark that contains several other accounts focusing on Jesus' power and authority. Lesson scriptures. Mark the 5th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Then it skips to the 18th through the 20th verse. Verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gardarenes. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. They refer to Jesus and his disciples. The other side of the sea is the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And this region was broadly called the Decapolis, meaning ten cities. Verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed with an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. To have an unclean spirit indicates supernatural possession. Any Jew approaching the demonic would con consider himself unclean because of his continual proximity to dead bodies. Verse 3. Who had his dwellings among the tombs, and no man could bind him? No, not with chains. The man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. The man's coming out of the tombs and dwelling among the tombs were calls for instant concern. These tombs would be caves or carved into rock, forming a necropolis, city of the dead. Once the possessed man lost control of himself, his community tried to step in. Verse 4. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Though binding him with chains may once have worked, the demon would then grant it such perverse strength that the demonic plucked asunder those restraints. His strength was matched by a wildness that no man could tame. Verse 5. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. It seemed, however, that one characteristic of demon possession is a loss of control over self-preservation. But a demon within could overwhelm you and put you in circumstances where burning or drowning was likely to occur. In the demonic case, he had lost so much control that even his instincts to care for himself were overridden. No one could prevent him from hurting others or himself. Verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. In context, it is clear that worship does not refer to religious type of worship, since a demon would not worship Jesus. Instead, it refers to the act of bowing. This idea is used of worshiping God or idols or bowing in obeisance. But for a king, or even welcoming an honored guest. Demons well know who Jesus is and are rightly terrified of their coming judgment. In keeping with what has been described about the gardering demonic, the demon was actually doing the talking. No human had yet acknowledged Jesus to be the Son of God, another clue that the demon knew what others did not. Verse 7, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. With a shriek he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you don't torture me. The title, Most High God, emphasizes God's absolute rule over the heavens and the earth and under the earth, including every creature within those realms, supernatural or not. 
The demon was subject to Jesus and his commands, just as the waves and the winds were on the the journey across the sea. Verse 8. And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Jesus could have cast the demon out immediately, could even torment the demon. Verse 9. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Legion ordinarily referred to a Roman military unit consisting of approximately 6,000 foot soldiers plus a mounted attachment. In giving this name, the demon not only stated that they were many, but also implied that they were strong. The word is used in the New Testament to refer to large numbers of spiritual forces, whether demonic or angelic. But Jesus needed no tips or tricks to obtain power over the demons. Instead, Jesus was preparing to teach the disciples a lesson of the utmost importance. No matter how the powers of evil stacked against him, Jesus was always in charge. Verse 10, And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again to send them to some distant place. Jesus could send the demons into the deep, And this is found in Luke, the 8th chapter and 31st verse, which seemed to be a place of punishment for demons preceding the final judgment. Verse 11. Now there was nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Because swine were unclean for Jews to eat, Their presence was a reliable indicator of a Gentile population in the settlement. They were acceptable, sacrificial animals and pagan religious ceremonies. So they served that additional function as well. Verse 12. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. Having come face to face with the Son of God, Legion knew Jesus would not allow them to remain in the man any longer. They recognized that Jesus was in complete control. Verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. What the unclean spirits experienced here was a foretaste of the defeat that Satan would experience following Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Though Satan looked for victory over Jesus, what the devil experienced was an unexpected to him and thorough defeat. Even though Jesus seemed outnumbered, there was never any doubt about his victory in this encounter. This was not a final defeat for the demons as Jesus had apparently acknowledged. It wasn't yet time for their ultimate demise, but this was a foretaste of what was coming to them. Verse 18, and when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. But the herdsmen didn't see the extraordinary sign of God's goodness and the victory over evil. The fear caused them to ask Jesus to leave. And that is in verses 14 through 17, which is not part of this lesson. So Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. He that had been possessed with the devil knew what a miracle his healing was. And he appropriately hoped to follow Jesus and continue to learn from him. Verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. But Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Because Gentiles did not have the scriptures to refer to or learn from. 
Eyewitness accounts of the Jewish teacher and the healer would prepare soil for faith to come. Verse 20. So he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all the men did marvel. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of the region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Today, this region is located in northwest Jordan and southern Syria. Though the cities were not officially allied, they shared cultural and economic ties, as well as a desire for relative independence from Rome, which they were granted to a degree. And our questions for today, I want you to write your answers below in the comments. So, number one, if there was a before and after picture of your life, what would it look like? Number two, what is one of the most noticeable transformations that has happened to you because of Jesus? And number three, share your experiences with your transformation. Conclusion. Jesus' earthly ministry did not include limits based on typical human barriers. His encounter with the Samaritan woman, and we talked about that in an earlier lesson, is a prime example. In Jesus' presence, many of the boundaries that we have put up or that others have put up around us disappear. As we find our identity in Jesus, we can become the conduit of mercy and grace to those who we encounter. The living water Jesus gives us is available now and will continue to well up in us until we reach the age to come. The gift we find in Jesus is not a stagnant thing. It moves us from old to new, death to life, lost to found, enslaved to free. It means we are saved. And I thought to remember, Jesus has the power. Will you cry out to him? If you have enjoyed this lesson, give us a thumbs up. Share this lesson. Get into a Bible study group, whether it's online or live. Get your shots, wear your mask, stay six feet apart, love each other, pray for each other, and I will see you all next week.